This video looks at the definition of the phase margin. So the first video demonstrated the importance of the distance of the Nyquist diagram from the minus one point. And <coughs> you'll remember that if you have a standard feedback loop a bit like this, you're actually doing the Nyquist diagram of g of s times m of s. However, we also decided we needed a bit more precision. What do we mean by distance? Because we were rather vague in the first video. And what do we mean by close and far? So this particular video is going to start looking at adding some precision to that. And in particular, we're going to focus on phase. We're going to say, what do we mean by the phase being close or far to the minus one point? You'll remember that the previous video has already looked at gain. So we're going to introduce this terminology, phase margin. Now you're reminded, what is a margin? A margin is how much space you have to a boundary. Now, because we're talking about feedback loops and Nyquist diagrams and the like, what we're actually interested in is a boundary to instability. And what you'll remember is that if the Nyquist diagram goes the wrong side of the minus one point, you're going to be closed loop unstable. So the phase margin tells us what's the gap before we go closed loop unstable. And because it's phase, in particular, what we're saying is, how much can I rotate the Nyquist diagram before it goes to the minus one point? And you'll see, in, in essence, that's telling you the phase change you're allowed before you go unstable. And that's why it's called phase margin. So how much can I rotate the Nyquist diagram before it goes through the minus one point? And the changes we're going to consider here are additive. So we're saying, how much can I add to, add to the phase or subtract from the phase or in other words, how much do I rotate the diagram? So here's an illustration, and then it will become relatively clear. So you'll notice we've got a Nyquist diagram here for 1 over s, s plus 1 squared. And we're asking ourselves, how much can we rotate this to make it go through minus 1? Well, there's the minus 1 point. Now, if a rotation, a pure rotation, is going to go through minus 1, then we have to have a point who's got a gain of 1. And that's this point here. And you'll notice we've marked it because we've used the unit circle. So this point has got a gain of 1. Now if I put in here an angle theta, then clearly if I rotate that point clockwise through an angle theta, then it will arrive at the minus 1 point. Now in this particular case, what I can show is that theta equals 21 degrees. So for this example, the phase margin is 21 degrees, because that's the clockwise rotation which will bring me to the minus one point. Now it's important to remember that if theta is computed down here, and you'll notice we're in quadrant 3, so if theta is computed in quadrant 3, then it's treated as a positive number. So if I need a clockwise rotation to get from here to the minus 1 point, that's treated as a positive phase margin. Here's another example. And again, you'll see it's a different Nyquist diagram, but a similar sort of picture. The unit circle is marked here, so this is where the Nyquist diagram crosses the unit circle. If I rotate this one, and the angle I need now is this theta here. If I rotate it through that angle theta, then I will end up at the minus one point. Now, in this particular case, this angle theta is actually 68 degrees. And again, you'll see we're in quadrant three. The rotation required is clockwise. And so this is treated as a positive phase margin. So there you go. The phase margin is defined as positive when the required rotation is clockwise. So we'll add a bit more formal maths here, just to be careful. So we're saying find a rotation e to the minus j phi, OK, such that g j omega times e to the minus j phi equals minus 1. So you'll notice e to the minus j phi is a pure rotation. So we're applying a pure rotation to g of j omega, and we're saying what pure rotation? 
will give us minus 1. Now, in order to solve this, we must first find an omega a frequency such that the modulus of g of g omega is 1, because the modulus of e to the j phi is 1, so all the gain change has got to come from the g. Now, if I look at the phases in this statement here, which I've just put a red box on, you'll see you end up with this. The argument of g of g omega minus phi equals minus 180 degrees. So, in order for the phase margin to exist, the Nyquist diagram has got to cross the unit circle, otherwise I can't solve this. Okay. We've defined positive phi to be clockwise. Okay. And that's why we had this e to the minus j phi. So a clockwise phi gives an e to the minus j phi gives you the actual effect in the complex plane. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the intercept p with the unit circle. And what you'll find is if you solve this identity here, equivalently, you get this identity here, that the positive rotation phi required, or rather the clockwise rotation phi required, is given by 180 plus the argument of the point that you've just met. Now, if I do a little circle um, diagram just so you can see why this might be the case, if this was your Nyquist diagram, and this was your unit circle, and you're looking at this phi, then you'll notice the argument of p here, let's say for example is going to be something like minus 150 degrees, and you'll see if you add that minus 150 in here to 180, what you end up with is plus 30. So this formula works, and it allows you to get around the fact that we're defining the phase margin clockwise being positive, even though normally with co complex numbers, clockwise would be negative. OK, let's get to the fine details then. First, we're going to need this concept of a gain crossover frequency. So what is that? You'll notice the phase margin was defined where the modulus of g of g omega is 1, or if you look at the Bode diagram, 1 corresponds to 0 decibels. So the first step is to find where the gain is 1. So I draw this line across the 0 decibel line. There's the 0 decibel line. And I look for where the gain plot crosses 0 decibels. And this gives me the gain crossover frequency. So it's where the gain plot crosses the 0 decibel line is the gain crossover frequency omega g. And this omega g is the frequency we need in order to calculate the phase margin. So here's the procedure for finding the phase margin. We need to first solve modulus of g of g omega equals 1, or in other words, we're finding the gain crossover frequency omega g, which is defined as the modulus of g of g omega g equals 1. Once we've done that, we find the argument g of j omega g. So we find the argument at that frequency, and then we can use this formula here. The phase margin is 180 plus the argument of g of j omega g. So there's the phase margin. Now, here's a warning for you. For most real systems, the phase margin cannot be computed analytically. It's not really a pen and paper exercise. And you will have to use numerical approaches or approximate approaches or Bode diagrams. However, full completeness will demonstrate on a few um, examples which can be done analytically because it's useful to reinforce the procedure before you revert to numerical approaches. So here's the first example. g equals 1 over s, s plus 0.2. We want to find the phase margin. And you're reminded the first step is to find the frequency where the modulus of g equals 1. So I can write the modulus of g equals 1 over the square root of omega squared omega squared plus 0.2 squared, and this is going to be set equal to 1. Now, if I solve that, what you'll find is I end up with 1 equals omega to the 4 plus 0.2 squared omega squared, or 
if I rearrange this into a quadratic, I've got 0 equals omega to the 4 plus 0.2 squared omega squared minus 1. And if you put that in your quadratic formula, you'll see that's solved by omega squared equals 0.98, approximately. Right, and the next thing to do is to find the argument of g at that point. So we can now do the argument of g of j into the root of 0.98 is going to be minus 90 minus 10 to the minus 1 of the root of 0.98 over 0.2 and this is going to give you 11 point or oh sorry I shouldn't have written that quite yet and then finally we're going to put this formula in. So the phase margin is 180 plus the argument of g. And so what you're going to get is phase margin equals 90 minus 10 to the minus 1 root 0.98 over 0.2, which is 11.4 degrees. Next example, g equals 10 over s plus 1, s plus 2. So again, the first step is to find the frequency where the modulus of g equals 1. So the modulus of g is given by 10 over the square root of omega squared plus 1, omega squared plus 4. And if I rearrange this, I've set that equal to 1, I'm going to end up with 10 squared equals omega to the 4 plus 5 omega squared plus 4 and so putting everything on the same side I get 0 equals omega to the 4 plus 5 omega squared minus 96 and you plug that in your calculator and you'll get omega squared equals 7.6 so that solves for my gain crossover frequency next Let's work out what the phase at that frequency is. So the argument of g equals minus 10 to the minus 1 of omega, minus 10 to the minus 1 of omega over 2. And you notice we're going to get omega from here. We've got the phase margin equals 180 plus the argument of g, which is therefore equal to 180 minus 10 to the minus 1 of root 7.6 minus 10 to the minus 1 root 7.6 over 2 and you stick that in your calculator and you will end up with 56 degrees. So we've introduced a measure of distance from the minus 1 point which is the phase margin but you might want to ask yourself how big a phase margin is big enough? Well, typical guidelines are that the phase margin should be around 60 degrees, but I do need to emphasize this word around. It's not an exact point, it's an approximate point. Now, this is often a design target, by which we mean if your phase margin is smaller, you might well get poor behavior. If your margin is bigger, you may well find the system is slow or detuned. So another point, however, is you'll see in point two, we said that 60 degrees was approximate. It is somewhat arbitrary. There's some basis for second order systems, but you do need to be flexible. For some examples, you find 45 degrees is quite enough. And then for other examples, you might find you need nearer to 70 degrees to get good performance. So 60 degrees is an indicator. Now, just a note to finish with, and we didn't say this earlier, that in order to get a phase margin of around 60 degrees, then if I sketch my Nyquist diagram, this is implying that you're calculating the phase margin. 60 degrees is there. And what does this tell you? It tells you that the Nyquist diagram has got to cross the unit circle in quadrant 3. Now that's quite important because visually it tells you where you expect 
the Nyquist diagram to be. If your Nyquist diagram is not crossing the unit circle in quadrant 3, it's unlikely that you've got a phase margin which has an appropriate value. So some conclusions. The video is to find the phase margin, which is an important design tool with frequency response methods. A positive phase margin is defined as the clockwise rotation, and that's important, which will cause the Nyquist diagram to go through the minus one point. To compute the phase margin, you start by determining the gain crossover frequency, in other words, where the modulus of g of g omega is one. There will exist cases where the phase margin is undefined, in other words, if the Nyquist diagram never crosses the unit circle, but that's pretty rare. Typical design guidance is that the phase margin should be around 60 degrees. If it's smaller, you will probably have some oscillation, and if it's larger, you'll probably find that you're detuned to some extent. And the other thing is that using this 60 degrees tells you that your Nyquist diagram should be crossing the unit circle in quadrant three.